The year was 1839. An event took place on reportedly the third day of Nisan, although the historical accounts vary a little bit. This event, probably about 11 days before Passover, took place in the northeastern corner of the nation now known as Iran. It was historically known as Persia. If you check the map of Iran slash Persia, you will discover that there is a city there, quite a well-known city for many different reasons, and the name of the city is sometimes referred to as Meshed. That was the name by which I always heard it referred to also referred to as Mashad. I learned recently that one pronunciation is Turkish and one pronunciation is Farsi. This event, March 19th, 1839, was a pretty scary event. As you know, Iran is a nation that is overwhelmingly Shiite Muslim, but at the time it had, especially in that city, a fairly significant and well-known minority Jewish community. The, the accounts have come from a man by the name of Joseph Wolfe. Joseph Wolfe was a British Jewish Christian missionary who visited Mashhad twice, the second time after the event took place in 1844. I'm going to quote from Joseph Wolfe's work. Quote, all the Jews of Meshed, a hundred families, were compelled seven years ago to turn Muslims, is Muslims, the occasion was as follows. The poor woman had a sore hand. A Muslim physician advised her to kill a dog and put her hand in the blood of it. She did so, when suddenly the whole population rose and said that they had done it in derision of their prophet. Thirty-five Jews were killed in a few minutes. The rest, struck with terror, became Mohammedans. And the fanatic and covetous Mohammedans shouted, quote, Light of Muhammad has fallen upon them. They, this is the Jews, are now more zealous in secret than ever. But they call themselves Jews like the Jews in Spain, Anusim, the compelled ones. Their children cannot suppress their feelings when their parents call them by their Mohammedan names. A later account by the same author, by Joseph Wolfe, there are several accounts of this event referred to as the Al-Ahdad, and I'm going to click forward here. This, by the way, is an image of the Jews of Persia, Iran. The image is from Tehran, the capital. It's not from Mashhad, where this event took place. Uh, but there was back then a sizable Jewish community in uh, the nation referred to as Persia. In the year of 1838, he gives a different year date on this account, the Mohammedans celebrated the Feast of Bayram. On that very day, a Jewess slaughtered a dog at the advice of a Mohammedan physician for the purpose of washing with the blood of the dog her own hands. One of the Muslim Sayyids who heard it and to whom Jews previously had refused a present, probably meaning a bribe, Calling, called together all the Muslims in the mosque of Imam Riza and addressed them in the following manner. People of Muhammad and Ali, the Jews have derided our feast of Bayram by sacrificing on the very day of our feast the dog. I shall now tell you in two words what must be done. Allah dad, which means God has given. They took the illusion and whilst the Asuv Ud Dola, the Mirza Askeri, the Imam Juma, and the rest of the authorities were sleeping. The whole pop populace shouted, Allah Dad. And with this shout of Allah Dad, they rushed into the houses of the Jews, slew 35 of them, robbed and plum plundered their property, and the rest of them saved their lives, but not their property, by reciting the Mohammedan Creed. Only a few of them preferred death to apostasy. Mullah Daoud Cohen, the chief rabbi and high priest of the Jewish nation of Meshed, gave the first example of apostasy. The year in, this, in which this happened still goes by the name of al Dad among both Jews and Mohammedans. In secret, they observe the Jewish religion, and they tell their children never to forget the event of al Dad. It's an interesting little piece of history, but a particularly interesting piece of history to me, because these are actually my people. Now, those of you who know me know that I was born in England, but my people were Persian Jews. And I read a book recently on this subject and read about family names of some of the people that I knew rather well.
The choice that was given to the Jewish community in, in Meshed at the time was one of three. Number one, you convert, you become Muslims like the rest of us. You must become Muslims and you're off the hook. Choice number two, leave town, get out of town. Choice number three, you die. Now, what happened at that point was really very interesting. And you can read about this on the internet, by the way. If you do research, there have been books published on this, and it's really quite fascinating. Most of those people, my ancestors, three or four generations back, uh, became what are often referred to as crypto-Jews. In other words, on the surface, they were Muslims. They went to the mosque, they recited the prayers, they did the bowing down that the Muslim men did, and yet privately, and in a measure of fear in their homes, they became secret Jews, also referred to as Marranos. To our Spanish-speaking brethren, that will mean something. The Marranos were the Jews in Spain. It, the word means pigs. The Jews in Spain who, after 1492, pretended to become Catholics, but tried to maintain their Jewish identity privately. The phrase that is used for these people in uh, Mashad was Jadid al-Islam. The word Jadid means new. They were the new ones to Islam. Now, how many people really knew that they weren't deep down really converted to Islam? Well, that's a good question. Probably changed as time went by, depending on who was in charge of the country, who was in charge of the city, how deep and how visceral the expressions of anti-Semitism were. But allegedly, they became Jadid al-Islam, new to Islam. Some of them took on some pretty crafty little ways of maintaining their Jewish identity in secrecy. They feared to close their shops on the, on the Sabbath. They knew if they closed their shops down, it would automatically label them as Jews. And then they ran the risk of being persecuted or even put to death. And so the uh, stratagem that they adopted was to put one person, often one of the children of the family, out in the shop and if a person came in and said, I want to buy that, they pushed the price up so high that there was no deal. Avoid trading on the Sabbath, see? Other things took place that were not quite as pleasant. Some of the very zealous uh, Shiite Muslims believed that the Jews were, uh, were unclean. And when the rain fell, the water that washed off the Jews rendered a Muslim unclean. And therefore, they had to cross the street to avoid being close to the Jews as the rain washed off them. And there were occasional acts of violence. In my grandparents' generation, there were still quite a few Jewish people in the nation that we knew it as Persia, not as Iran. You've read about Persia, of course, in the Bible. You've read about uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, a good bit more enlightened than the leaders of that nation now or even the leaders of that nation back in the 19th century. But uh, as time went by, a lot of people began to get out. I've got cousins all over the world, by the way. I have cousins in many, many different uh, countries of the world. And I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't have any people still in Iran. I remember back in my uh, grandparents' home, sometimes a letter would arrive, and it was written in Jadidi. I remember them saying, this letter is from a family member, a cousin. It's written in Jadidi. Jadidi was Hebrew alphabet and Farsi words. They used the Persian language, but they used the Hebrew script. But many of them, of course, began to get out, and they're now scattered all over the place. It's quite a big Persian Jewish community in New York City. Now, that kind of religious persecution is the sort of thing that many of us have never felt. Never, many of us have never experienced that. Probably most of the people here today were born in the United States of America. And what a wonderful nation the United States of America is. Sometimes we underestimate it, you know? Sometimes we underestimate it. We don't realize how deeply rooted in this country is the notion of religious freedom. Why did they come to this country? They came to this country because they wanted to get away from Europe. Well, what was wrong, wrong with Europe? State religion, state religions. We don't want to be part of a state religion. We don't want to live in a country where Catholicism or for that matter, any other religion is the state religion. So they came to the United States of America. And when you look at the history of the Church of God through the 20th century in particular, I think you have to conclude that the church could never, never have done what it was able to do had it not been based in the United States of America.
Other countries have freedom of religion. Western Europe has freedom of religion. But the, the church had to be based in this country to enjoy the wonderful freedoms that we, ha that we have in this country. Persecution, religious persecution. We have that yet to come. So today what I'd like to do is to talk about something that the Bible talks about as perhaps the worst of the end time religious persecution, something that lies ahead of us, and it's the mark of the beast, as you can see from the beginning slide. What is the mark of the beast? How does it come about? Where will it come from? And what is our hope when that comes on the scene? I actually had a, a message from a man. He wrote to me electronically about a couple of months ago because I'd published uh, our LHT article on the Mark of the Beast on my uh, social media feed. And he wrote to me, and I think he was a little bit alarmed. And he said, well, when is this going to come? And I wrote to me, back to him and I said, I don't know. And he said, well, do you think, he, well, he pressed me a little bit. Do you think this is coming, you know, next month, next year? I said, I don't know. Uh, because I don't, and nor do you, but we know that these events will take place. Uh, and the Bible actually gives us quite a bit of information about these events and the things to watch for. Let's begin then in the book of Daniel chapter 7. I'd like to begin in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel does not use the term the beast, but there is, as you're probably aware, a lot of tying together between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Mr. Meeker does a very good job in covering that in the class on prophecy that we have at Foundation Institute. Daniel 7. And let's pick it up in verse 23. Daniel 7 and verse 23. Daniel says, I was watching something we need to do. And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now that's happened historically, but it will happen again between now and the return of Jesus Christ. Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. There was a judgment in their favor. Why? Because they are the saints of the Most High. Hopefully that's you and me. Uh, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. There's always a, a, a note of hope in all these prophecies, difficult and dark as many of them may be. The events that we're going to talk about in this sermon will come very shortly before the return of Jesus Christ and the setting up of the kingdom. Verse 23, thus he said, uh, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and he shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. This fourth beast, the Roman Empire, is different. It's more ferocious. It's more aggressive. Verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. We understand that the three first kings were not religious in the same way as the subsequent kings were. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Now, there's a quote, by the way. I was looking for it just before services got underway. It's on page um, 35. Uh, you've probably got this at home. Maybe you haven't begun reading it yet. But there's a very good quote on page 35 uh, from a, a Catholic priest describing how the Sabbath was changed. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So Daniel chapter 7 prophesies of a time of persecution that is yet to come. That's ahead of us. It's not happy news. It's not happy news. I thought about this sermon. I thought, should I preach on this? You know, this isn't a happy preaching subject. Uh, you have to wait three and a half years until it gets much happier. But uh, it's something that we need to understand. There will be a time of persecution against God's people, and it certainly seems that it's not that far in the future. Uh, I didn't tell that man how many months and years, because I can't. But uh, certainly it's looking as if it's not that far in the future. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit here and let's go to the New Testament and ask ourselves, who or what is the beast? Now, there's something important that we need to understand when we come to the book of Revelation. And that is that the term the beast is actually has two meanings. Number one is the empire, the political power. 
Most of the references to the beast in the book of Revelation refer to the empire, the empire itself. There is, there is another reference, and let's turn to Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, and I'm going to click forward here. There we go. That's from our own publication. We'll come to talk about, about that shortly. Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20. This is something that's a little bit difficult to grasp, but we need to understand it. Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20. Here in Revelation 19, the term the beast refers to an individual, one man. Revelation 19, verse 19. And I saw the beast, one man, not named in the Bible, obviously, not named by us, but we'll come to that in a moment. I'm going to tell you who he is. No, I'm not. <laughs> and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him. Him is Christ, of course, who sat on the horse and against his army. One of the things that has come up in class over the last many years, every now and then a student has raised his or her hand and said something like, but I thought the millennium was a time of peace. And there are many scriptures in the Bible that indicate trouble and war at the beginning of the millennium. And it's true. The millennium is a time of peace, but note what happens here. One of the very first things that happens once the millennium has already begun is to put down a rebellion. Let's keep reading verse 20. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. See, they work together, political figure and a religious figure who work signs in his presence by which he deceived those who re received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. They cast into the lake of fire. Who is it? What's his identity? What's his name? We don't know. When I first came in contact with the church, I remember one of the speculations, and it was speculation, but one of the speculations back then was that it was Field Marshal Joseph Broz Tito of Yugoslavia. That name may not mean very much to some of our younger folks. To the older folks, you may remember that name. I, some of you may remember. You may remember some of the old literature. It said, Watch Tito. You remember that? Watch Tito. Well, I watched him, and he died. And after he died his nation sort of fell apart in multiple bits. And of course, uh, there was a lot of trouble, a lot of suffering after Yugoslavia fell apart. It was not Tito. We also speculated a little bit about a man by the name of Franz Joseph Strauss. Again, he's long since disappeared from the scene. A Bavarian, German, nationalist politician. You know what? He actually came and visited Ambassador College many years ago and was deeply impressed by it and marveled at the beauty of Ambassador College. The beast is not, was not Tito, and was not Franz Joseph Strauss. We don't know. We don't know who it will be. But we do know quite a lot about the system and about the empire that this individual will he head. So what I'd like to do in the remainder of the sermon is spend some time, two chapters, and if you're a note taker, you might just want to note, note down Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. We're going to go through most of these two chapters and comment as we go through. Revelation 13, the beast that comes up from the sea. There's quite a bit here in the Bible about the beast. Verse chapter 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. This is the Apostle John. Now, he's alive right at the end of the New Testament period. As you, uh, the first century ended, I think the uh, New Testament historians say the 90s AD, maybe some say maybe even going into the second century uh, AD. Uh, but he's the last one. And he receives all of these visions, prophetic visions that he himself had difficulty understanding. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, says John, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. This is someone who rises up in defiance against God and heads a uh, unified empire. Horns symbolize political, military power in the Bible. Seven heads and ten horns horns, that this last revival of the Roman Empire that will shortly come on the scene will encompass ten nations or perhaps groups of nations. Verse 2, now the beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Much we could say about all of that. Fast moving. 
The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. So the power of this beast power that will come on the scene will come from Satan, the devil. Now, I think we always need to qualify that just a little bit. The power does come from Satan, the devil. But if you look closely at some of the things that it says in the book of Revelation, there's a little bit of a detail in the wording there that I found very interesting. That it was given him authority. The book of Revelation will say, and we'll read one or two of these briefly, he was given authority to do these things. It states it in the passive voice. And I think that's done deliberately for you and me, because we know from other scriptures that God is in overall control. And there's another layer, right? A spiritual layer where demons and Satan, the devil, can do certain things. Let's keep on reading verse 3. Uh, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. That's a historical reference to the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West in 476 AD. Again, I'll plug the booklet. It's covered in the new booklet. I saw one of his heads mortally wounded and his deadly wound wound was healed. He keeps coming back to life. Over and over again, the Roman Empire comes back to life and will yet one more time. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Why? Well, one of the things that we know, especially if you travel to Europe these days, you can see how uh, secular the part of the world it has become. Knowledge of the Bible has dissipated far more than it has here in the United States of America. And people are going to be impressed by this, by the beast and the false prophet. They won't understand what we can understand from reading these chapters in Bible prophecy. So they worship the dragon, verse 4, who gave authority to the beast. They worship Satan, the devil, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Now, when we look back into the Old Testament prophecies about some of the great empires, Assyria and Babylon, they're often described as like a crocodile in the river or a great tree and the birds of the air come and nest under the branches. You know, the point being made here is that when you've got a a bully on the world scene, people want to protect themselves by being in with the bully. And uh, that's what's going to happen one more time. Uh, Who is like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? Obviously, these are things that we'll need to steer very, very clear of. Um, Let's keep reading. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verse 5, he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Uh, Like I said, I've always found this to be the encouraging point. He was given authority. It doesn't say he had authority. It says he was given authority. Uh, Go over these passages in the book of Revelation for your own personal studies sometime, and you'll see how many times the passive voice gets used where it talks about these events of the last days. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think the point that's being made is God has chosen not to intervene yet. He was given authority. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. We've got the righteous angels in heaven. Jesus Christ, the Savior, is in heaven. And the tabernacle mentioned there in verse 6 is very likely a reference to the church of God. So we've got this power raising his hand, raising his fist, and screaming abusive language against God and against the righteous angels in heaven, and also against the household of God, the church of God. Look at verse 7. Look at that one more time. Look at the wording again. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome him. He was given this permission Presumably, this could not happen if God didn't allow it to happen. Satan, the devil, has great power. God has greater power. He makes saint, war against the saints and he overcomes them. And authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's you and me. Our names in the book of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But you know, this is going to be a very, very deceptive time. And when this takes place on the scene, and I think it will certainly take place in the lives of many of the young people uh, uh, here today, perhaps not in my lifetime, I don't know. Um, We don't know for sure. But when this takes place, we need to be well informed enough that we recognize what is taking place before our eyes. Those whose names are written in the book of life. So, 
As we come through this, we need to ask our, ourselves the question, okay, what is it about this power that we must not participate in? What is it that, we, what is it that God prohibits? Why may we not take the mark of the beast? In a sense, that's a much more important question than what exactly is the mark. But let's keep reading for a moment. Uh, verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is important. Verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Isn't that an amazing statement? Whoever kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. I think I heard around the office this week that the title of Mr. Frank's um, uh, feast sermon is, My Kingdom is Not of This World. Here's one of the reasons why. You kill by the, with the sword, you get killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. It uses that phrase as well a couple of times in the book of Revelation. Patience, faith, and both will be required at the time of very great crisis that is yet to come. This is a little bit of encouragement for the saints of God. Um, let's keep on reading in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Now, we know who the lamb is. We know who the lamb is. The lamb with the capital L is Jesus Christ. But he doesn't sound like the lamb. He speaks like a dragon. And in John chapter 10, we read about the, the, the sheep recognizing the voice of the lamb. This one set, look, looks like the lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. He impersonates. The voice is the voice of the dragon, but he tries to look like the lamb. Verse 12, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we've got here the religious power working together in concert with the political and the military power. The religious power coerces, presses, pushes people in that direction. And then he works miracles, verse 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now there's a thought. Miracles are usually worked by God's servants. We see God's servants all the way through the Bible working miracles, beginning with Moses and Elijah and the, and the others, the prophets and the disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, and the early Christians. And yet here we find an example where this false one will have the ability to call fire down from heaven. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, one of the things that you discover, and I know many, many in this congregation are well-traveled, you travel to Europe and you discover that the cultural and the religious flavor in Europe is really quite different from the way it is, at least in the south of the United States, where people still talk Bible. Um, they still talk over the water cooler or over their coffee. They talk about their religion. Western Europe has become extremely secular. Uh, the knowledge of the Bible has perhaps not entirely drained out of Western Europe, but most of it is gone. And so we read here about this one is going to, going to call fire down from heaven. And back in Deuteronomy 13, and we won't turn there, but in Deuteronomy 13, where we read about the test of the prophets, there's an implicit admission that from time to time, someone who is not a true representative of God is going to be able to work certain miracles. So it's going to happen. You ever thought about that? You know, that's going to be quite a time because you're going to have almost a duel going on on the earth. Revelation 11, which we won't take a look at today, but Revelation 11 talks about the two prophets, the two witnesses. And what are they able to do? Well, they can uh, turn the waters to blood and they can stop the rain from falling and everybody gets mad at them. And here's another one on the scene at the same time who's able to call fire down from heaven. It's quite a thought. It works miracles. Let's keep on reading verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling them that the thought here will be, oh, if he can do things like that, this must be a man of God. How could this possibly not be a man of God? You and I know better. We better hold on to that telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and lived. And traditionally, we've understood this as referring to the papacy. 
Uh, let's read here a little bit. No, I want to turn to Matthew 24 and verse 24. Keep your place in Revelation 13. Matthew 24, verse 24. Can God's people be deceived? Can they? Well, read the New Testament. There are too, too many examples of God's people who did get deceived by one thing or another. Matthew 24, verse 24 tells us that false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24, verse 24. The Old King James Version words it differently. It says to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. But there's actually, as I recall, there's no verb there in verse 24. So it appears to be granting the possibility that even the elect can become deceived if they let themselves. Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 13, because here's where we begin to get to the matter of the mark of the beast, this thing that fascinates people. Um, a lot of people want to know about the mark of the beast. What do we know about it? Verse um, 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So, What's involved, what is it about this worship system that is forbidden for us? Which of the Ten Commandments are being violated or will be violated by those who are part of this system? Well, we just read part of it, worshiping the beast and worshiping his image. And that, of course, is a violation of the Second Commandment. The second commandment is violated. Now, traditionally in God's church, we've also said the fourth commandment, and I think that's correct. It doesn't mention the Sabbath explicitly in this chapter, but I think we're on pretty safe ground. You know, we, we know about the, the uh, switch, about uh, uh, substituting Sunday for Sabbath keeping. So very likely we're looking at uh, infractions against two of the Ten Commandments. This is the reason why we're told to steer clear of it. Uh, verse, um, and though, to finish reading verse 15, uh, those who would not worship the image, image of the beast to be killed, we're not to worship anything other than God. We can't participate in this. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. You can't get out of this. You're a little person, you're a wealthy person, you can't get away from it, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. What is this mark? What is this mark? Now, what, in thinking about this sermon this week, I spent a bit of time uh, preparing for it. I came to realize something, that really it is much more important for us to understand the spiritual angle than for us to understand the physical angle. What is the mark? Well, okay, the Bible mentions it. It talks about a mark. The Greek word here is haragma, haragma, a mark. And in the New Testament, if I got this right, it's used only in the book of Revelation. It's used several times. What is the mark? I did a little bit of research, and you probably don't have a Bible with the Apocrypha in it, but uh, there's one other place in one of the Apocryphal books. That's one of those non-inspired books that are included in some Bibles. And I'll give you the reference if you want to check it. It's in 3 Maccabees 2, verse 29. And it uses the same word, 3 Maccabees 2, verse 29, talking about Ptolemy, the king of the uh, south. 3 Maccabees 2, verse 29, those who are registered are also to be branded on their bodies by fire with the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysius. And they shall also be reduced to their former limited status. 3 Maccabees 2, verse 29, for what it's worth. That, of course, is not inspired scripture. But the New Revised Standard Version here uses the word branded, some kind of brand, some kind of brand. We think maybe of the uh, consecration camp uh, survivors, and you've all seen the tattoos on the arms of those who survived the concentration camps. I'm getting into the, a little bit into the realm of speculation here. Maybe some kind of a tattoo. Uh, maybe some kind of branding. Will it be some kind of biometric of some kind? You know, uh, I'm a, a bit of a technology Luddite, and uh, I took a long, long time to eventually get a, a smartphone. I was one of those people who were using a flip phone every, for long after everybody else had moved into the 21st century. So I'm not very good with this kind of stuff. Uh, could it have something with a credit card? Would it be a chip? 
inserted some part of the body? Honestly, we don't know, brethren. We really don't know. It will be something very compelling. It is referred to as a brand of some kind. But I really think that the important thing is that we understand the spiritual aspect of this more than the physical aspect. I think when we see the physical aspect of it, if it does look like one of these UPC, I don't think it'll be a UPC code on the, uh, on the forehead, but I think you and I will recognize it. But the uh, uh, spiritual aspect is more important. Okay, let's keep on reading here in Revelation 13. They receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. Now, let's think about that for a moment because shortly I want to take you to an Old Testament passage that uh, actually uh, bears on this as well. But shouldn't get ahead of myself. Um, then verse uh, 17 and that no one may buy or sell. So you're locked out of the economic system if you don't bow the knee before the system, except for one who has the mark, the charagma, or the name of the beast, maybe a personal in, maybe knowing this person or his associates, maybe having some kind of political connection. We don't know or the number of his name. And of course, this is the other part that has fascinated people because we're about to read the number. We read the number. But before we get there, let's take note of something. We're reading about a system that will dominate politically, militarily, and economically. Economically, I think, is important because what we read about here and what we'll read about in Revelation 17 as well is a command economy. In other words, whoever sits on top of this says, you will do this, you will do that. You've got to render obeisance to this system. You've got to worship the beast or you don't get to earn a penny. And also the other part of it is you're going to do this, you're going to do that. It's not economic freedom. But let's keep on going. Let's read verse 18 and then I want to show you something from the Old Testament. Here is wisdom. Now, everybody wants to be wise, so everybody wants to figure out the number. You know what the number says. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. Here in verse 18, it refers to the individual. And his number is 666. And of course, people are fascinated by that. Sometimes people are fascinated by the part of it that they shouldn't be so fascinated with. And the part that we're really supposed to focus in on, which is the spiritual repercussions, maybe get glossed over a little bit. But of course, everyone wants to know, well, what is this 666? And we've uh, written about this in the church over the decades. I remember when I first came into contact with the church and reading about this in the old Bible correspondence course, it appears to be associated with the Roman system in one way, shape, or form. I can remember years ago sitting down with pencil and paper and playing with the number 666 because, you know, all the, all the uh, letters have a numeric value. And I actually succeeded in making Fidel Castro the beast. I don't think that Fidel Castro, I don't remember how I did it. It was a real feat of mathematics, but I made Fidel Castro. And I sat down with a number of other different names and played around with them. You know, again, we don't know for sure. I find it interesting that God has placed this in the Bible, you know, because people are obviously going to be fascinated by it. But, um, you know, seven is God's number. Six is man's number. So we can't take the number and we can't take the mark and we can't have this uh, uh, name either. I think maybe that refers to perhaps a personal acquaintance. Again, I'm speculating just a little bit. I'm trying very hard, brethren, to place a nice clear line here between what the Bible says and leave his speculation, okay? Because we can go too far into speculation when we talk about uh, Bible prophecy. All right, so those who are involved with this system are guilty of violating commandment number two, which is against idolatry, and almost certainly guilty of violating commandment number four, which is the Sabbath commandment. They go together, and like I said, even though it doesn't say it explicitly, I really think we're on really pretty safe ground when we say that. All right, how many of you know what this is? This is an image of Jewish men at worship, and they are dressed, if you go to a Jewish synagogue, there's several here in Dallas, as you may know, if you go to a Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath or a holy day, you will see the religious men dressed like this, although I actually think they don't wear the phylacteries uh, on the Sabbath, if I remember correctly. They do it on other days, if I remember. They're wearing the prayer shawl, the talis, and they're also wearing what are referred to in Hebrew as tefillin. 
the phylacteries. Now, notice where they're worn. These are those leather straps and a little box. You may have seen this before. Little box worn just under the hairline. Why? Because you think with the brain and you've got God's law on, in your mind. The little box contains a scroll, tiny, tiny little scroll with Deuteronomy 6 and other scriptures. And then there's another little box that actually goes on the left hand. I don't know why Judaism has developed the, uh, the concept, the custom of placing the phylacteries on the left hand, but these are phylacteries or tefillin. Where did the Jews get this from? What's the point of this? Why do religious Jewish men lay tefillin, as to use the term? Why do they? I, I remember doing this, by the way, after I had my bar mitzvah. I was given a set of tefillin, phylacteries, and uh, for a little while I wasn't really very zealous because you have to get out of bed early to do your, your morning prayers. You have to be up early, and there are certain prayers you have to recite. And then you have to wrap these things around your arm in a particular way. You roll up your sleeve and you wrap them around the forearm and even around the hand in the form of the letter Shin on the, on the hand. Shin is for El Shaddai, uh, the, uh, one of the names of God in the Bible. Deuteronomy 6. We'll come back to the book of Revelation just momentarily. Deuteronomy 6. When we put Deuteronomy and the book of Revelation together, we can see something rather interesting, that the mark of the beast symbolizes overt, defiant rebellion against God's law. And back in the book of Deuteronomy, God told his people, you should take God's law and internalize it. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6. Moses says here, of course, Deuteronomy 6 is very famous because it's the chapter referred to as the Shema. I'm not going right, jumping right over that, but Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Prophetic of the new covenant, right? Hopefully us. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So hopefully when we go to the Feast of Tabernacles this year, some of our conversation will be spiritual. We're not going to go to the Feast of Tabernacles trying to impress one another with just how spiritual we are, but we hope we'll talk about the sermons and we'll talk about the God's way of life and so on. And then verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They're bound as a sign on the hand. The Bible doesn't say how. Jewish tradition has established this uh, tradition of phylacteries, little leather boxes and leather straps, and they shall be as frontlets, the totafot, I remember the Hebrew. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And then verse 9, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You may have seen, if you've ever had Jewish friends, there is a mezuzah on the door frame. And religious Jews will put a kiss on their fingers and kiss the mezuzah as they enter that house uh, in conformity with what it says here in verse 9. Deuteronomy 11 verse 18 says something very similar. Deuteronomy 11 verse 18. So the Bible makes it really pretty clear because there's an obvious contrast between what we read in Revelation 13 and what we read especially in the book of Deuteronomy about binding God's law in our hearts and in our minds. We don't have to do it this way, obviously. There is a, a deeper spiritual way of doing that for us. But let's take a look at uh, Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Moses here says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Isn't it interesting? I've often wondered why it is that the Jews put the phylacteries on the left hand, uh, and I'm not quite sure. I think it is because most, uh, most people are right-handed, and therefore it's to avoid kind of um, restricting the, uh, the arm that is a stronger one. I'm not sure. Uh, the book of Revelation says the right hand. Uh, Deuteronomy, uh, well, the Jewish tradition, let's get that right. The Jewish tradition has the left hand. But whatever the case, it begins to be pretty clear, doesn't it? Those who take the mark of the beast are, um, I shouldn't always say knowingly, I think maybe of them, many of them will not know, but knowingly or unknowingly in overt rebellion against God. So what have we learned so far? What have we learned so far? We've learned that this is going to be a time of huge trial for the people of God. Revelation 14. Revelation 14. 
Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10. Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10. The third angel, verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image, that is forbidden, you don't worship anyone other than God, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence and in the presence of the Lamb. It's going to be a time of huge trial. It's going to be a time when no doubt God's people will wonder, you know, what am I supposed to do if I'm locked out of the economic system? God will provide, of course. He will provide a way out. But I think that doesn't dilute the fact that it's going to be a time of tremendous trial against our faith. The other point that I want to mention here before coming to Revelation 17 is a very important point. Very, very important. And I want to emphasize this. And that is that this mark of the beast that we saw comes from outside of the United States of America. This is very important. I'm emphasizing this now because, as many of you may know, some of the chatter on social media indicates enormous confusion on this, huge confusion. Where will it come from? From the resurrected Roman Empire. That is where it comes from. And frankly, so many of the theories that are out there at present, if you filter them through the Bible, you have to reject them because they are unbiblical. I won't dwell too much on that. I realize that this has become, you know, a very controversial area. But brethren, we must form our beliefs on what the Bible says, not on what swirls around in the culture. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that this mark of the beast comes from the resurrected Roman Empire and will be imposed on the world. That is what the Word of God said, says. Now, Let's stop and think for a moment, because we read about an economic system that is to be imposed on the world at some point in the future. And, um, you know, then we wonder about some of the things that we've gone through this year, and it's been a very, very trying year. Prior to the pandemic, the deficit, federal deficit of this nation was about $1 trillion dollars per year. That means, translated into your family budget, that means that you're earning 80 and you're spending about 100. Those are approximate numbers. That's where we were prior to the pandemic. Where are we now? Well, the numbers are pretty st staggering. Uh, $2.7 trillion of a deficit so far this year. The uh, uh, CBO predicts a federal budget deficit close to $3.7 trillion this year. Now, I haven't done all the numbers, but it looks to me in a very uneducated way as, as if that means very likely that the federal government is spending roughly $2 for every $1 it's, it brings in. And the same problem everywhere. It's not just the United States of America. It's Europe and it's China as well. There is a huge gaping deficit. Um, the CBO predicts that the national debt of this nation will eclipse the annual economic output of the United States in 2020, with the ratio of federal debt to GDP rising to 101%. In other words, if everybody dedicated every last penny that they earned for an entire year to pay off the federal debt, it would, you know, without spending a penny on anything else, that's what it would require to pay off the uh, federal debt. This is frankly unsustainable in the long run. Proverbs 22, verse 7. Proverbs 22, verse 7. We'll come back to the book of Revelation momentarily. Proverbs 22, verse 7. Proverbs 22, verse 7. You may remember Vice President Dick Cheney, very famous quote from the Vice President who served under George Bush Jr. He said very crisply, quote, deficits don't matter. Look at what the Bible says. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, I'm not suggesting that this problem of the buildup of debt is restricted to this nation, but of course, this is the wealthiest nation in the world, and it is a very important economy in that respect. So, while the Bible doesn't connect all the dots for us, 
I think when we look in Revelation 13, we see very clearly that the economic order established post-World War II has broken down at that point. My speculation, okay, I'll, la I'll label it speculation, but my speculation is that that economic order breaks down because of the load of debt on the world economy. So, you know, I don't know that for sure, but I think it's a pretty, pretty important thing for us to keep our eyes on. Uh, the, the debt load is going to be very difficult to deal with because you've got one major party that won't cut back on the uh, programs and the expenditures and you've got another major party that doesn't want to raise taxes and, you know, tune in and watch TV tonight and see how much difficulty they're having agreeing on some of the less important things. I think it's unsustainable in the long run and I also think it's quite certain that when the events that we read about in Revelation 13 uh, come, the US dollar is no longer the reserve currency of the world. And that's going to have implications for you and for me and for our families and for the church of God. Sometimes we don't realize how important it is that the world reserve currency is the dollar from this nation. If you traveled, I travel quite a bit in Latin America, and many of the Latin American nations are dollarized. They want dollars. Uh, some, uh, El Salvador doesn't even have its own currency. They use the dollar. In many other parts, they want the dollar, parts of Europe as well. It's still the dominant currency. How long will it remain? I don't know. We need to keep our eyes on these things as they move forward. Revelation 17, we need to go th to Revelation chapter 17 and comment on that. Revelation 17. Revelation 17, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. It's an old King James kind of a word for something that's not very complimentary. She's a prostitute who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Somebody asked me uh, a while back, what is the meaning of this word fornication in the scriptures? What does it mean? It means mingling together on the basis of unprincipled religious and political alliances, something that God doesn't want his people to do. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. She's sitting on the beast. That is a euro, two euro coin. It's actually the Greek euro coin, but they uh, look the same throughout the eurozone, except that the name of the nation looks different. Now, if you look closely, what you see is a woman riding on top of a beast. I wonder how much the people in Brussels knew about what they were doing when they put this image on their coins. I think there may have been some knowledge of it. They've got a different story. The woman is Europa, a goddess from Greek mythology, and the animal, the beast, is the Greek god Zeus, the consort of Europa. Interestingly, the historical forerunner, Antiochus Epiphanes, placed the statue of Zeus Olympus into the Holy of Holies. Remember Mr. Burnett's sermon last week about abominations. That was at least part of the abomination of desolation. Now let's keep on reading here. Uh, and in verse, um, uh, verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, very wealthy, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Why is that Roman system referred to as Babylon in the last days? Uh, I'll refer you again to the new booklet. I've been sort of pecking at it. And uh, Mr. Lukey makes the point rather well that that system in the last days will draw its cultural and religious roots from the Babylon system. In fact, time wouldn't allow this, but if you, can, if you take, want to do an intertextual study, Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, and then flip back and forth with the prophecies about Babylon back in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah 14, Jeremiah 50 and 51. It's a fascinating intertextual study. This is the Babylon system based in the resurrected Roman Empire. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, God's people. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. This is the European power. And uh, the uh, New Revised Standard Version has, I was greatly amazed. 
We shouldn't lose sight of this, brethren. This is to take place before the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, but the angel who said to, said to me, why did you marvel? I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. This is the revival of the Holy Roman Empire that's come as a result of a huge crisis. It's suddenly come about. Verse 8, the beast that you saw him was not, uh, was, was and is not, let's read this carefully, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Again, they're amazed, the New Revised Standard Version, whose names are not written in the book of life or in the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And there's a good bit that could be com commented about that, but they'll be amazed. Our attention mustn't be misdirected. We don't have to be amazed. It'll be, an, uh, it'll be an astonishing thing, but we should know from the scriptures what's going to take place. Verse 9, here is the mind that has wisdom, the seven heads of seven mountains on which a woman sits. When I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, I learned something interesting. Cincinnati, Ohio is referred to as a city built on seven hills. Have you ever heard that? This is not talking about Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, uh, if you go online, I did this and I checked, it's interesting, again, there are several cities around the world that are built on seven hills. Lisbon, Portugal, I didn't know that. Helen Richards knew that. Lisbon, Portugal is built on seven hills. This is not Lisbon. And I think one of the cities of uh, Brazil, several other cities refer to themselves as cities built on seven hills. Which city is it? It's obvious, it's Rome. It's Rome. The Roman system will be resurrected prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other one has not yet come. Isn't that interesting? This was to be revealed and understood at a particular time in history. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. There's the good news. It's not going to go on very long. Verse 11, the beast that was and is not and is himself the eighth is of the seven and he's going into perdition. Verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. They haven't yet. But brethren, again, I want to emphasize our attention needs to be on what's going on in Europe. A lot is taking place in Europe. It's under the radar screen for American foreign policy. And it's under the radar screen for too many members of the Church of God. We need to watch what's going on. There are things going on in Hungary, in Austria, in parts of Europe now that will play into Bible prophecy. And we'll come to that momentarily. Uh, verse, uh, I lost my place here, um, uh, verse 11, verse, verse uh, 13, they have one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Now, the European Union at present is allegedly a democratic institution. Now, it's slow and bureaucratic and ponderous. One of the reasons that the Brits voted to leave was because it is so bureaucratic and it seems disconnected from the people. But it is allegedly a democratic 27-nation uh, union. What we're reading about here is that these 10, it's not 27, it's not 28, these 10 in a moment of crisis yield up their power. They say, you take the reins of power because we're facing such a crisis now and we can't find any way out of it. This is not democracy at work. This is not democracy at work. This is a strong man strong man. Have you noticed what's happened this year since the coronavirus fell? How many of the more authoritarian regimes around the world have grabbed the opportunity in a very opportunistic way to strengthen their control? Hong Kong. You read about Hong Kong? You read on the news this morning about Belarus, little nation in Europe. I had to check to see exactly where it's located, but it appears that someone, the 26th year uh, leader who seems to have been voted out of office took the opportunity to brutalize his own people. Um, in moments of crisis, these dictator type individuals take advantage of the moment to grab extra power. But this will be a moment of great crisis when they yield up their power to the beast. They yield up their power to the beast. We need a strong man. Europe that brought us a strong man. Uh, twice in the 20th century and brought world wars, will once again say we need a strong man. Let's read a little bit more, and then I've got one more illustration that I'd like to show you. Verse 14, 
These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he, the Lamb, Lamb with capital L here, is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And that's going to be a very, very good thing. One of the first orders of business that Jesus Christ will have to do when he comes back is to put down this beast's power. There's going to be a rebellion against him, make no mistake. And those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That's us. People who understand the prophetic events through the prism of biblical revelation. All right, so what have we seen as we've read so far before we begin to wrap this up? Number one, at this point in history, before the return of Jesus Christ, the domination of the world by the Israelite nations is over. The Brits dominated the world in the 19th century. It was referred to often as Britain's imperial century. And then the United States of America through the 20th century, but reluctantly, USA, always a kind of reluctant policeman. Look at the history of this nation. It's quite different from the history of the European colonizing powers, but still to a great extent dominated by the Anglo-Saxon nations, the English speaking nations. That will end. That will come to an end. Number two. The dollar ceases to be the reserve currency. Why is it possible for the United States to exert economic pressure at present? Because a dollar is a reserve currency, and the banking system of this country is something that exerts control. We read about this a lot, and it's been used frequently by presidents, both Republican and Democratic, over the last uh, many years, since the Second World War. That comes to an end. That comes to an end. Does our ability to do a work come to an end? I think very likely what we're able to do as a church will be very, very different at that point. And the world will then be dominated by this power in Europe referred to as the beast. Now, I mentioned that things are taking place in Europe. A lot is going on in Europe, and it's passing under the radar screen of too many people. We need to focus on some of the things that are going on. I want to show you something. This is the German Bundestag. Lots of parties, like in many nations in Europe, lots of different parties. And you can see the two biggest ones. The biggest one to the right there is the CDU, the Center uh, Right Christian Democrats, uh, 246 seats. And the red block over on the left is the SPD, the Social Democrats, the Center Left, 150, 163 seats. They're presently in a coalition. Germany has had difficulty having a one-party government for quite a long time. So these two centrist parties have come together in a coalition. But what I want to draw your attention to is the blue area over on the right. Now, you probably know what that is. This represents the largest party in the German Bundestag that is outside the coalition. And it's the extreme right party, referred to as Auf für Deutschland. Excuse my German. My German's not very good. I'm better in Spanish than in German. But... Um, uh, it's the Auf für Deutschland, and it's referred to as the alternative for, jo for Germany, and it's the extreme right party. Until very recently, it was unthinkable. It was a political blasphemy in Germany to go out to the extreme right. In 2013, in the Bundestag elections, that extreme right party did not make the 5% threshold. In 2017, they suddenly leaped above the 5% threshold and now have the largest number of seats outside of the coalition. I don't know how it goes. You know, will they lose seats in the next election? Maybe. Will there be a, a steady movement forward as there was, you know, 1930s? We go back to 1930s. Remember that the Nazis came to power initially having formed some kinds of coalitions. And this extreme right party has many different political currents in it, uh, not necessarily uh, unrepentant Nazis, but people who are saying now what Germans wouldn't say for decades well, we're a great nation and we don't need to be ashamed of what happened. Watch what's going on. The Bible doesn't say explicitly that Germany will be at the heart of the beast power. But I think it's, a, again, I think it's a pretty fair bet based on our knowledge of history that this beast power will emerge from Central Europe, from the Germanic nations. Um, let's, um, let's, go, let's begin to wrap this up. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 2, Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel sees this famous image. He's interpreting it for Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, I'm sure. Daniel 2, verses 41 through 43. Let's read these uh, uh, three verses. 
describing the fourth kingdom, the Roman system. Daniel 2, verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. Isn't that an interesting comment? Now, again, I'm getting a little bit speculative, but elsewhere in the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as the clay. And Assyria, modern Germany, there seems to be a tie-in here with iron. It's partly clay and it's partly iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Very likely, this ten-nation conglomerate will include some nations descended from uh, the patriarch Jacob and others that do not descend from Jacob. Verse 43, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, uh, just as iron does not mix with clay. And then verse 44, and here's the good news. And this is such a big verse that I, I think we really do need to read it. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall not be left to other people. It shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So there's the good news. There's the good news. What is the good news? The good news is that it doesn't last very long. World War II went on for about seven years, didn't it? These events in the last days will last about half of that time. And if we're informed, we know that there is hope beyond that. Let's uh, read Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. And I want to read verse 28. Because Jesus here has something very important to tell us. He says, look, you're going to see these things. When you see these things, the good news is the return of Christ the Savior is close at hand. Luke 21, verse 28. Jesus says, I love this verse. Luke 21, verse 28. Now when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. It's going to seem very, very bad for a while. Very bad. But Jesus said, Christ the Savior tells us, look, when you see these things, you know that your salvation is getting near. Verse 35, for it will come as a snare on those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. There's my last slide. I won't read that. It's from Revelation 1, verse 3. I'll simply finish with the thought. Brethren, it, things are happening. Things are moving on the world stage. Our eyes need to be open. And our eyes need to be open to what the Bible really says. And whenever we encounter ideas that don't stand up to the light of biblical revelation, we really must have the courage and the integrity to reject those ideas. This is so important. If we don't, who knows where we end up? Do we end up getting taken in? getting fooled by some of these things. But as we come up to the fall holy days and, and uh, first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, seven weeks away from now, let's go, let's keep the feast. Let's keep the Feast of Trumpets looking forward to a reality not that far in the future, the return of Jesus Christ and the Day of Atonement looking forward to another reality, the removal of that dragon who's going to give power to this last day's entity his removal from the scene, and ultimately a wonderful, wonderful time when our redemption comes, our salvation comes, and God sets his hand to saving the whole world.